So welcome to the Living Earth Festival 2018. We're on our last day. It's been such a wonderful time being here with these um, presenters. And today we have our final panel discussion, palm trees, food deserts, and herbal teas, food sovereignty and youth empowerment. So it's gonna be a great panel discussion. There'll be time for questions and answers following. So if you can hear my voice and like to uh, listen in, please come over. We have plenty of chairs where you can sit. And this portion is going to be um, facilitated and moderated by, oh, our beautiful Camille. Where is she? Oh, there she is. She is um, a tourism lady, Native American, uh, American, Native American, Alaska Native Tourism Association, and she is here and uh, knows a lot of stuff and we'll be, we'll be introducing the panel and we're in for a treat, especially this portion because it's not just about um, the adults, it's also about how we bring in the young people in the community and I love that. I think that's wonderful and it strengthens, 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 strengthens us all when we have our young people be part of um, this wonderful food sovereignty movement. So let's give Camille a big round of applause as she makes her way up. Everybody make noise, yay! Nanakchish, Ganakchish, and Yatkosani. I had to a South Sea Stankla, I had. Ladies and gentlemen, I just said thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, my name is C.A. Stankla. I am from Sitka, Alaska, born and raised. I am now um, living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I went from a rainforest to a desert. I am um, Clinkett Indian, and I am honored to be here to be the moderator for this great panel. And um, currently, just so you know, I am, um, I am the executive director for the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association, which is a national association that represents the 573 tribes. It is a great honor to be here to, um, to not only um, meet a variety of people, but also learn what these people are doing to actually um, promote food sovereignty, and be a part of the, the growing trend of agritourism. So without further ado, I'd like to, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then they'll continuously um, talk and introduce themselves. And then what they'll do from there is we'll, um, right after they're done, I have a, a few questions that I'd like to ask, but then encourage you all to ask questions. This is your opportunity to um, you know, get all your answer, or questions answered. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce um, Ms. Tori Lynn Smith. And um, she is actually, um, she's a, she works for the Kahali Youth Leadership Development Specialists for the Maho um, Organic Farms. And she will be actually speaking with Mr. Josh Fugamoto. He's an apprentice farmer. And both of them will be speaking together. And then following right behind them, we're going to have Miss Loretta Livingston. She is actually from the Bad River Chippewa tribe in northern Wisconsin. We'll be looking forward to hearing from both of them. And take your little notes, get your questions ready, because uh, following that, we'll, I'll be asking a couple and then encouraging you to do so as well. Aloha Kako. Um, just a little bit about our farm. So we are, we are from Ma'o Organic Farms, which is located um, in a rural community um, on the island of Oahu. Uh, we are a 25-acre certified organic farm. Um, what, what's really unique about us is that our um, program is run by interns, uh, roughly ages 17 to 24 years old, and they basically run the daily operations of our farm. Um, so that makes us a little bit unique. And, and they're also um, pursuing their post-high education, so all of our interns are currently in college. Um, this is 
This is Josh. So Josh actually um, was a part of our YLT or Youth Leadership Training Program. Um, he's matriculated from there, and now he's a farm apprentice. Uh, aloha mai kako. Um, my name is Joshua Fukumoto, and like Tori said, I'm a uh, apprentice farmer at Ma Organic Farms. And uh, oh, I, I also um, I'm a student at the University of Hawaii studying sustainable community food systems. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Loretta Livingston, and I am a member of the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians, and I'm, my reservation is located in northern Wisconsin up by Lake Superior. I don't know if uh, you're familiar with that area. Um, Lake Superior is five of the, one of the five Great Lakes. We're bordered on one side by Minnesota and Michigan, Lake Michigan and Canada. And my claim to fame here for today is that I've been fortunate enough to be chosen as the um, coordinator for the Bad River Food Sovereignty Program. It's an effort on the a kind of a collaboration between the tribal government's effort to promote food sovereignty and the community's interest in food sovereignty as a movement. Um, we do involve youth. I have a, I partner my efforts with um, the U University of Wisconsin Extension Office. Ms. Joy Shelby, she uh, shares the office with me and we um, exchange ideas. Her principal um, part of this um, in this whole effort is to involve the youth. So she works with a number of the youth programs on the reservation, including Head Start, which is like a preschool program for three and four year olds. Four year olds. There is a boys and girls organization that takes children in from five to teen. And then there are uh, a number, like maybe two or three other youth programs on the reservation that she engages in activities with. And why that's pertinent to food sovereignty is that she directs a lot of the activities at the food sovereignty site. And our site involves, it's just kind of a beginning project, although we've been in existence for like maybe four or five years. We're still just kind of at the, in the learning stage. We have two high tunnels in which we grow uh, produce, and we're expanding um, the area around the building site to include such things as a berry patch, service berries, high, high bush cranberries, um, and teas. Teas, teas is, is teas like anise hyssop, uh, spearmint, um, lemon balm. We grow stevia, so it's kind of uh, an expansion of our original idea of what we wanted to do with food sovereignty. And the reason I mentioned the teas is that it's really produced a lot of interest in what's happening at our site. I mean, people ask us all the time if our teas are for sale. And we just don't have the staff at this point in time to really expand our operations. So like I mentioned earlier, previously, we're just kind of a beginning effort, but I am employed in the position where I get to do what I like to do and involve people and reintroduce people to the whole concept of gardening and growing their own food and being food sovereign for themselves. So, thank you. Now, what are the one of the things that I gathered just from their introduction is that they work with youth. You look at sustainability and you look at so food sovereignty. Sustainability to me is not really the monetary, it's actually how you're gonna keep it going. And in my, my experience, it's, it's working with the youth and then working with your elders and it's the ones that are in the middle that are carrying it out for now. So looking at what you've done, and, you can, and we'll start with Josh and work our way this way, um, what prompted you all to do what you do? 
your, you know, just in your own, from your own heart, and, and why, why, why you do what you do? Um, wait. Is it on? Hello? It's on. It's on. Can you hear? Hello? Okay. Um, sorry. Sorry about that. So I, I, I wasn't always a farmer. I've been farming with Ma'o for two years. Um, I was doing a couple of years prior to that at a research farm. But Hawaii, Hawaii has always been an agricultural state. And um, I, I can remember growing up and um, spending a lot of time at my grandparents' house. And in, in our yard, they, they just grew everything. You know, they grew mangoes, and I played in the mango tree. They grew their bananas. They grew all their food. And that was just, that was the common practice that I feel like, at least in my family, we strayed away from that. And um, when, I, when I got out of school and I started working, you know, I was working at different jobs, a lot in retail and um, jobs in the, the service industry. And it just wasn't really fulfilling to me. And I, I remember getting really disillusioned by, by just kind of, almost like working, working in a really like capitalist driven system. And uh, it wasn't until I got back to actually working on the farm, I, I always kind of had the idea that, you know, I was working for things like food. You know, food is, is a necessity and not as much other things. And when it, so when I, when I started going back to that and actually working on the land and being outside and feeling the sun, you know, hit my body, that really, I, I found work that I, I truly find fulfilling. Tori. Can everyone hear me? So um, for me, I'm not a founder of this organization, but I work there because I truly believe in the mission. Um, we are a social enterprise, so we um, generate revenue, but we also have a social mission, um, which is to help um, students in our um, community pursue their post-high education. And so for our organization, we, um, we look at food sovereignty and we look at um, education. And we're kind of, we, we, we wanted to do something that uh, incorporated both. Um, for our community, a lot of our community is in poverty. A lot of our community is on welfare, EBT, um, things like that. And so we see education and higher education as a way um, to help our community um, get out of poverty and earn living wages. I mean, in Hawaii, it's, it's really expensive. The cost of living is really high. Um, and, you know, fortunately for us, you know, there was not a, a forced removal like, you know, what we see here with our other uh, tribal brothers and sisters um, and indigenous peoples. But for us, you know, over time, we are being removed from, our, from the places that we live um, because we're priced out. Um, and at this point, um, a lot of Native Hawaiians cannot afford to live um, in Hawaii or places that they've grown up. So um, for us, that's what our founder's vision was, is to kind of put food sovereignty. Hawaii imports uh, approximately 85% of their food. Um, and our ancestors were completely self-sufficient. Um, you know, our population on Oahu is over a million. And our ancestors, the, the, the population was the same. There were, there were that many people, and they were able to sustain themselves. Um, and so we want to get back to that. So that, those, are, those are the two things and, and the vision um, of our organization. Hi. Um, what prompted me to be a part of this effort is that as, um, as an adult, I had friends who came from farming families, and I was exposed to you know, food that was grown uh, by them. And I, because my younger years were spent in the city, urban area, so I was used to going to the grocery store. But so then I started having a garden for myself. Um, and then um, when I became an elder, <laughs> I was part of the elder program at home. And they had like three small plots outside the elder center. And so I kind of took over them and then realized you couldn't grow much in the raised beds that they had. So then we expanded the garden. So I took care of the garden for like three years. And at about that same time, then the tribe, tribal government itself had this effort to become food sovereign and to um, 
look at the tribe becoming sovereign in terms of being able to provide for themselves and becoming less reliant on going to the grocery store for the food. And part of that was prompted by the fact that people had, uh, the majority of our people were experiencing ill health, health problems like obesity, um, diabetes, heart trouble, because they weren't exercising, they weren't eating right, and so that was what prompted the tribal effort. So we, I, we, I kind of came from it from two sides, and I've always been involved in my community as a young adult, as a young person, in fact, and then as an adult, and it, it seemed like food sovereignty was such a, a fantastic fit for me. It, it fulfilled my passion to work hard, uh, to uh, my, uh, fill, fulfill my desire to see immediate positive impacts because when you put a seed in the ground two weeks later you have this beautiful living plant that is um, growing and then you have this tomato that you can make salsa and tomato sauce and all that, all the good food and you make salsa in the summertime and in the winter time you, you can enjoy the fruits of your labor from the summer before so um, it it just made sense, and it, it, it's created an avenue for me to achieve um, personal fulfillment, but at the same time to provide uh, a way for me to make a positive impact in my community by reintroducing people to the beauty and the necessity and uh, the uh, fulfilling a purpose for living on the beautiful land that we are fortunate to live on. We live by Lake Superior. We live, we have a river, we have forest areas, we have wild rice. We have just so much bounty that is provided by nature that we've all lost touch with. And it, it, it's a pleasure for me to reintroduce that sort of lifestyle to my own people. So. Those, those are definitely two very, you know, you, you both are two real examples of why, why you're doing what you're doing. And it's very important as we, you know, have been eating these foods that aren't good for us and to know that we're going back and the reasons why these, 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 these two groups are very passionate about what they're doing is because they see the impact that they're doing. Now, looking at the success of your programs, if you, if you could, what, what will you be doing? What, what, what is your next steps? I mean, what is, what is your vision for what you're doing now? And where do you see yourself going in the future? Josh. How about the expansion? Um, okay, so, I mean, we're a 24-acre organic farm right now. And the next steps that we are actually working on is expansion. So we just, um, through, through different grants and money that we were able to raise, we purchased 21 more acres, um, not adjacent to our property, but within the same valley. And then there's another 200, 230, 200 plus acres right across the road from there that we're also working on purchasing. But the idea is to eventually, you know, quadruple production potentially, but there's some areas that are, are sloped onto a mountain that we would really like to create into low-cost housing for our farmers, so people like me and then Nanea, who's here in the audience, you know, um, to to have land that would be before agriculture and for housing our farmers in perpetuity. I would also say that um, in terms of expansion, we definitely would like to expand um, the number of youth that we serve um, in our area. Um, I would say that for us, if you look at our, so our students are, well, for, for the most part, they're pursuing an AA or associate's degree, and some matriculate into a bachelor's degree. Um, our graduation rate uh, is about 41% of those who come to our program, um, which isn't, isn't a great number, um, but we, when we compare that to um, our students that are not in our program, in our community, um, attending that, that same college, their graduation rate is about 15%. Um, so we feel that our program is, you know, has an impact and is, and is helping to support the interns that are in our program um, get through college. But ultimately, we would love to expand. We, we see right now we have about 50 um, interns in our youth leadership program. Um, and as we expand our land, uh, we would also like to expand um, our youth reach. 
As far as expansion for uh, Bad River Food Sovereignty, I think the youth are the answer. Um, like, like I mentioned earlier, I was, have been involved with the elderly program for a few years, and I, have, I, I um, take care of the garden for them, and, and they're very grateful. And they're, they're, we had a tea event this past spring in which they were all just enamored of the teas that we grew for them. But um, they're not physically interested in really you know, becoming more involved with with gardening, so it's the youth that we need to teach. And fortunately, like I mentioned also earlier, I partner with Joy Shelby from the UW Extension Office and, and her primary focus is youth. So we bring the youth to our, we have events and activities where we show them what's involved in tilling the earth, planting the seed, harvesting, weeding, and we need to, um, you know, expose them to what it means to grow your own food because it is hard work. It is, but it's also rewarding and it's also uh, sort of it's it's therapeutic. You know, you you lose yourself in the monotony of the weeding, um, and they you see that you you have immediate gratification because when you harvest, then you you turn what you harvest into um, food that will sustain you through the winter. So. I think that the youth are the future. So we have applied for some grants that we won't know about till this fall, and, and part of that grant would be to train 15 youth um, each year for three years. We would provide like eight different workshops that would give them skills that they would need to further our effort. And to at, hopefully at the end of those three years, we will have established an organization that would allow us to become sustainable financially and otherwise. So those are our immediate plans. I mean, the future is in the youth. We need to get them involved and interested and trained and um, pass on our passion in this area to them. So the, the expansions that you talk about are, you know, I think are, 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 is something that you can actually see down, see, see growing, but Looking at what you have now, can you explain what you are growing and maybe what you may want to expand on growing in your regions? Keeping in mind, we have two distinct different regions here. We have Hawaii and, and we have the Midwest, Wisconsin. So it is going to be different. But what, what do you have growing right now? And um, what do you see possibly in the future that you will be offering to teach the youth to grow? Um, okay, so I mean we're in Hawaii, so it's it's tropical, and you can we can grow pretty much at all times of year. Winter is actually our peak season, just because uh, we do grow a lot of kale, because for a lot of the businesses that we partner with, that's what's what's really in demand, and um, we do a lot of native crops. We do ulu, which is breadfruit, maya, um, uh, kalo, uh, bread um, breadfruit, bananas, taro. A lot, of, a lot of the native Hawaiian staples, but then also a lot of the more um, crops that I guess you would, you would say are more Western. So a lot of radishes, turnips, um, different kinds of onions, uh, carrots, um, kales. Uh, we do a ton of fruits, and then with our expansion, what we do plan to do, because there are some areas that are sloped that we, we necessarily wouldn't be able to grow a lot of kale on, we would like to go into agroforestry and, and have a lot more, um, I guess, diverse fruits, like maybe, maybe a lot more citruses, mangoes, uh, lychee, longan, things like that. Nice. Um, for me, well, we're a part of the same organization, so all of those things, but our model is um, growing youth, growing food. Um, so for me, my, my focus is on growing youth in our program. Um, and for me, they, they are going to college, but how, how else do we grow youth? So uh, for our program, we also run kind of our own curriculum, some social and emotional curriculum um, to kind of teach the soft skills that they may not be learning in school or in, in the Department of Education system. Um, so that's, that's a really important thing for me. Uh, the best way for me to answer is that we um, we grow convention 
quote unquote conventional food. I mean, we have the high tunnels that grow tomatoes, peppers, onions, you know, um, lettuce. We have green beans. We have all of the usual stuff that you would go to the grocery store and buy. And I don't foresee that changing a whole lot. I think the way that um, we're going to expand our program is to incorporate more of the natural foods, you know, the gathering of, of um, natural plants, herbs, medicines, and incorporating and assisting our community members in incorporating that into their daily life. Um, that includes things like um, we have a apple apple cider press at our facility. So, and the, right across the bay from us is uh, a, a, a Bayfield County, and they uh, have a lot of fruit berry farms and orchards. So we have access to those areas through cooperative agreements and we, once they're done with their their own uh, harvest, then we get to go in. For example, last year we went in and gleaned apples from the orchards there and we produced gallons of cider and we froze it and we have it available for community events. You know, um, we also, not only just food, but we have we engage in activities that are related to food. For example, again with the youth person, uh, we involve the youth. We have fishing expeditions. We have uh, we have treaty rights like spear, spear fishing on the inland lakes and rivers in the spring. Um, where we have experts from the community who come in and teach us how to um, process venison how to process fish, how to process all of these natural food stuff. So in that way, that's what we would expand um, so that we can have more activities um, that involve community members and, and again, re reteach them and reintroduce them to what's available in our own environment. So. I'm gonna put my tourism hat on um, a little bit. If um, do you guys have um, visitors that come in, and do you guys do tours um, that are, and are those tours available to the public? And if so, how could people actually contact you? And then um, I know that um, there, we, there are a lot of youth out there that become the teachers. You know, they're taught, and then they become the teachers to the visitors. Do you guys have that same sort of opportunities? And Josh, if you want to. Um. So we do we do tours, and it might not be uh, like agro tourism is a thing that's that's starting to happen more and more. But it's not necessarily we we don't have buses of people coming to our farm or anything like that. We we get a lot of groups, uh, actually like a lot of tribal groups or native peoples, not just from the Americas, but um, one of our founders he's uh, from New Zealand or Aotearoa. So we get a lot of Maori groups who like to come and see what we're doing and. Oftentimes, a lot of the issues that we face in our community, um, things like lack of, of food security, uh, high levels of diabetes, heart disease, things like that, these are applicable to communities all over the world. And they always want to know how to replicate this kind of system in their own communities. So it's, it's a lot more groups like that. Nice, nice. And then I wanted to mention that one of our programs we have is a farm to fork program and this is kind of our community engagement. So in terms of touring the farm, we do have um, schools that come into the farm um, and bring keiki, which are children, uh, to come and tour the farm, get their hands dirty. Um, they also, you know, for our community, we have uh, rates of, we have health disparities in our community. We have diabetes, a lot of the things that were mentioned. Um, earlier today. So for us getting, you know, we can grow vegetables, right, and fruits, but if our kids aren't eating them, then, you know, what's the point? So we, we really want to engage students in, in creating new healthy eating habits. So um, oftentimes in our farm, farm, to for, for, farm to Fork program, um, there will be students who come and we will often do a cooking demonstration or some kind of food preparation activity. Um, so those kinds of things happen at our farm as well. Nice. Um, our operation is really small and we are really, although the effort's been alive for like four or five years and I've been involved in various capacities in that effort, um, we're still just beginning. 
But amazingly so, having said that, um, we do have a lot of interest in what we're doing there. And it, it, it's frankly kind of surprising to me because, um, again, Joy Shelby and, and, and I are really the two main people involved in this effort, although we do have support from the tribal government and other community members. Uh, we're hard working, just like I'm sure the, the, you know, all the groups here are today. So it's always surprising to me that I'm doing something that I like and I work hard and then we have visitors to our site and they go, wow. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we grow our own food, you know, and we we like what we do and and because we we work hard um, and we're dedicated, um, it, it, it just shines out as a good example for people. We have visitors all the time and we start talking about what we're doing here and we sh I show them, you know, our cucumber trellis. I mean, <laughs> and our high tunnels and our berry patch and our chicken coop and, you know, this and that. And they're just totally amazed by it. But I think, again, another part of that is just that people are just not used to doing for themselves anymore. And so it's, it's, um, it, it's rewarding for me to have uh, my efforts and Joy's efforts and the youth's efforts validated by someone who can come and say, wow, you're doing a, a terrific job. So that provides encouragement for us. You know, um, I want to actually thank all of you for coming and listening. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to... Um, if you could just say one one thing to the audience, and the audience is actually on the World Wide Web right now, you are live. If you could say anything to 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 spread your message, what would what do you want to say? And Josh, we'll go ahead and speak. We can start right off with you. There's over a, a trillion people watching you right now. Just I'm just kidding. <laughs> no pressure. Um. So. Well, I'm actually, I, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to borrow from the Bad, the Bad Rivers presentation yesterday, but there was a quote in there that said um, that we were not truly sovereign until we can produce our own food, and that is absolutely the truth, and I would encourage everybody to, you know, if you have a garden, just plant some stuff in the backyard. Oh, for me, there's so many, there's so many takeaways um, that I would want to share, but um, I think, you know, as we all kind of have mentioned is that, you know, the investment in our youth is, is one of the, like, it is the most important thing. Um, how much we invest in our youth, um, they are the answer and, and we need to constantly be passing and teaching, teaching them. Um, you know, for us, we, we're, we work with teenagers, right? How do you get teenagers to get up in the morning, right? Some of our, our teenagers start at 5 a.m. Some of our, our not teenagers, but they're, they're transitioning into early adulthood, right? And that's kind of a, that's a tough transition uh, for a lot of them. How do you get them to get up and be passionate? Um, and I think that's just through, that's through time and that's through investment. So investing uh, in our youth is, is, really, is really important. And that, that would be the takeaway um, that I would want to share. What I would like people to take away from what, um, you know, what I would like to share is that it, um, gardening and, and farming and engaging in this type of food sovereignty effort is that you reconnect with the land. Mm -hmm. You know, we've lost that connection. And it's amazing that um, we don't have that. And it's been such a part of our history. And, and we need to reconnect and we need to find a way to fit it into our busy lifestyle. I mean, I, I worked full time before I assumed this position and I also gardened and uh, at one point I had a full time job and I used to garden in the back of my dad's house and he would say well then I, I, I assumed this full time position but I still had to garden at his house he said well what are you going to do you know now that you have this job and your garden is going to be growing and you know how are you going to handle that and I said well I'll just take the time off but you know not everybody has the luxury to do that or is able to make that choice. But that's part of what my mission is in my position is to teach people how to transition into making that a part of their life. Because everybody 
has to work to support themselves at a job. But, you know, it's also a full-time job to grow your own food and provide for yourself. So it can be done. It's just, like she was saying, you know, youth transi transitioning into adulthood. It's a transition you learn over time. And, and that's what I would like to have people take away, that it's important that you make that transition and fit it into your life. Yeah, and I think there, the big, probably a good question is how do you um, have youth want to do this? I mean, how are you guys, you know, you're competing, really, you're competing with sports, after school curricular activities, um, your iPhones, you know, the games. How are you competing to get those youth involved? I'll, I'll take this question just because. He's very farm intensive and I'm youth intensive. Um, but for me, it's really helping youth. For us, you know, of course we want all of the youth in our community to pursue a college degree. You know, that, that, that would be great. Uh, for us, the youth that come in, it's really investing time with them um, and helping them kind of find their purpose, you know, having them, uh, it, it's, it's small steps that I think over time eventually lead to developing the youth. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's just the investment of time um, and teaching them and, and giving them opportunities to grow, leadership opportunities within our organization. We, once they're a part of the internship for at least a semester, they can apply to be a step-up intern where they can you know, manage their peers and learn other kinds of skills. And I think you know, over time they, they, they develop. But you know, every day we teach them, you know, it's very, it's hard to wake up early. It's even hard to wake up early for me. And it's, I, sometimes I start later than them. And so, you know, that daily motivation, finding that, you know, we're in, like uh, Loretta mentioned, you know, this immediate gratification. Um, we see that a lot nowadays. Like a lot of our youth want to be immediately gratified and farming, you know, it's not as immediate as some of the other things that are competing for their attention. And so, um, the more time that they're able to spend with the land um, and reconnecting, I think they, they start to see, they start to see that. Um, and then ultimately, they're, they're investing in themselves, right? And, and, you know, for us, that immediate gratification, you know, it is two years, at least two years to get um, an associate's degree, which is a lot of time, but ultimately getting them to see that it's an investment for themselves and for their family um, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, and we, I have, I have one good example in my community. There was a program that's called Bad River Youth Outdoors. And, and it only, unfortunately, it only involved like six, seven, eight youth. But it was a program where, um, and it was sponsored through the university system. And the kids were um, required to wake up early every morning. And they, but they did fun things that reconnected them with the waterways and the land. They explored every inch of our reservation and um, my my granddaughter was involved in that and so I was able to observe firsthand the impact of this particular program and it's amazing because she got up every morning at six o'clock she had to get ready before her mom got ready for work she was there she had to catch a ride with you know her mom every day um, and now that was like four years ago five years ago and now she's still she gets up every day, takes a shower before everybody gets, you know, she gets her brothers and sisters up for school. She, you know, so it's just those little things where you teach them um, worth, work ethic, you teach them the value of getting up early. I mean, she's, she's still a teenager. She'll sleep late if she can. But it's just that little bit of a habit that was taught to her through a program, you know, where it was um, a learning Mm -hmm. It was a learning activity, but it was also a fun activity. And she was also exposed to the wilderness. She, um, they uh, canoed, they kayaked, they, you know, fished. They, they worked hard every day. And the, the person that taught that class, uh, they had to portage their own canoes. They had to <laughs> clean up after themselves every night. They had to put everything away at the end of the day. So, you know, that's how you do that. That's, you just, you have a program that incorporates fun and hard work. And over time, it reaps very many good benefits for the youth. Yes, Josh. 
Sorry, um, I'll just say really quick too. I, I oversee a team of six other youth and just on the ground level, I, I find that food is a really good way to keep kids engaged. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I, so we, I, we've gone through a couple teams and usually one of the first things I'll do is after we've gone out to maybe plant or harvest, I'll show them like, like sauteed kale is, kale by itself isn't that great, but if you saute it with some sauce, black pepper, salt, and you know, people, they always tell me like, oh wow, this doesn't have meat in it, you know, and it's, they, they like it. And then um, fruits, fruits are also nature's candy. Everybody loves fruits. <laughs> that, that, that's definitely true. Um, kids will be involved if it food, food and games, you know. So, but I, you know, this is just really remarkable. And what I would like to do is I'd like to open up the floor if you have any questions. I think the topic again is palm trees, food deserts, herbal teas, food sovereignty, and youth empowerment. Um, so, if you have a question for um, for for either J Josh, Tori. Um, or Loretta, please um, let me know and I can either bring the mic to you or you can come up to the mic and ask them yourself um, if you have any questions. <laughs> and don't be shy. Hi. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what kind of follow-up you're doing with uh, the young people as they're leaving your program? Because obviously not all of them are then going to become farmers within your programs. <laughs> so for our program, um, I don't know if I mentioned, but um, the youth in our program are pursuing all types of degrees, um, not just uh, in agriculture. Although we do have some of our interns uh, pursuing agriculture. Uh, for us, we're lucky in that we partner with the community college that our interns go to, um, which is a part of the University of Hawaii system as a whole. And so, you know, for those youth, I mentioned 41% uh, graduate. Um, for the rest of the youth, right, if they at some time, you know, it's really hard balancing school, work, um, their personal lives, um, and things like that, and some of them have to find other jobs. So we're lucky in that the university kind of helps us to also track when those students pop in and out of school um, over time. So that's kind of how we're, we're able to partner and, and track the, the, the youth that go through our program. Anybody else? Any other questions? Any more comments from our panelists? Just want to thank all of you out in the audience for listening. I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity for my program to share what we're doing. Thank you for listening. No, same. Thank you. Thank you so much for those who stayed throughout the whole thing. <laughs> well, this is, this is great. And, you know, do, you know, I know that you probably do have a few more questions. Maybe you may, it may come to you. They are, they're still going to be here. We're going to be here till 530. They have tables here. Make sure you go walk around and see what's going on. This is an amazing thing. Everyone here that is at, the, at this uh, festival, all of the panelists, um, are really coming here from the, from and sharing their knowledge from the heart, and they care about what they do, and they care about the people and the places that they work at. So, feel free to go up to them, ask them questions, and um, enjoy the rest of the festival. which means thank you.